lush, rolling golf courses dotting the country seem invitingly harmless. It's times when I could literally play every day. The lure of perfecting this game can turn a few hours away into a five plus hour commitment. It'll go from nine holes, 18 to 27, and it'll run past the time that I need him to be home. The term addiction isn't tossed around lightly, but it's not limited to substance abuse. When you're talking about like a substance addiction, um, you have a psychological dependency, as in you want to feel that high, just like golf. I've allowed it to take family, jobs. It was my drug of choice. Addiction, obsession, compulsion, uh, the little white lies that turn into pretty big lies. During that time, um, when I was feeling particularly like a golf widow, I started meeting other women who felt the same way. I put it out there and I started getting comments from women and I found out that it wasn't really a joke for everybody. The impact of golf addiction on careers and personal lives. Today, Outside the Line. Now, sitting in for Bob Lee, Andy Katz. Golf is an imperfect game, but one that has no lifespan. Bodies break down, but the game can be played well into your retirement, with senior citizens using the game for a sense of community, daily bonding, and a hobby that keeps them going strong. But for those who are younger, with more responsibilities, a full-time job, a family to raise, the lure to play golf and to try to perfect your game can be intoxicating. There are casualties if this goes too far, with the hours spent away taking away from family time, as well as production in one's job. ESPN's Shelley Smith reports on the golf addiction that can occur, even as the numbers show the number of courses closing is higher than those being opened, and participation in a perceived privileged sport is declining. Forty-four-year-old Eileen Coleman of Gibsonton, Florida, has only been playing golf for five years. Yeah, that's how it's going to be all day. <laughs> he started when his friends dragged him to a charity tournament. Another 18? That's it. He says by the sixth hole that day, Shut. he was hooked. And now he can't get enough. It went straight, straight er than it had before. So it felt really, really good. Really, really good. And I wanted to do it again. Nice shot. There you go. Big there you go. That's how you supposed to do it. We are playing about three days a week. I want to play more. As long as the course don't kick me off, I'm there. And Coleman is not alone. For some, golf can cross a boundary into obsession. There's Dan McLaughlin, who quit his job to commit 10,000 hours to try to become a professional. And then there's Ivan Morris in Ireland, who asked his wife to induce labor so he could play in a tournament. He won. Look out for the alligators. It's times when I could literally play every day. But do you know what the line is? You know what? Yeah, I go right up to the line. I go right up to the line. It'll go from nine holes, 18 to 27, and it'll run past the time that I need him to be home. Tacoma Coleman is Eileen's wife. I think I really realized it when he actually bought a set of clubs and took them to a place to get the handles, I guess, customized to his height. That's when I knew it, it was serious. You hit in the water? It's a little bit like a siren who calls you and captures you and takes you under its spell. Cindy Hoff created the Golf Widow Club, a website for wives and girlfriends of golfers who feel neglected at the expense of golf. I wouldn't say my dad is golf obsessed. However, when my first child was about to be born and I was going into labor and getting in the car to go to the hospital, he had a tea time that he wasn't <laughs> really ready to, to break. And so he said, I'll see you afterwards, okay, honey? Good luck, and gave me a kiss. At least it wasn't my husband. She started writing the blog when her husband, Darren, began trying to perfect his game. When you're out there and you're standing over your tee shot and you're thinking, boy, she's kind of mad right now. I wonder if I should be here. That's probably a pretty good indicator. You should be somewhere else. During that time, um, when I was feeling particularly like a golf widow, I started meeting other women who felt the same way. I put it out there and I started getting comments from women and I found out that it wasn't really a joke for everybody. 
a lot of the times they think of golf as just a fun activity for everybody else to play. Yeah, that's a pretty strong ball. Jiro Nakazaki is a PGA instructor outside of Chicago with a background in psychology. Nice. Who says golf can become a very real addiction. Feeling like I'm closing the club face. There's definitely a physical and psychological side to it. Physical being when you just catch it flush off the center of the face. That feeling is absolutely amazing. When you're talking about like a substance addiction, um, you have a psychological dependency as in you want to feel that high, just like golf. And when is too much too much? You know what, that's where we have to draw the line, right? Um, that line we can never see. You can't perfect this game. This challenge is beyond real perfection. And that's the draw. 61-year-old Doug Johnson says golf has been a part of his life for more than 50 years. Living in the Minneapolis suburbs during the 1980s, he played up to five rounds a week and was more concerned about developing his golf swing than his career as a salesman. You're traveling around and you see a golf course. Well, I'll just go to the range. And I'll just go to the range turns into, I can do nine holes. And I can do nine holes turns into, well, I can do 18 holes. For an addict, the worst thing you can hear is something like, well, honey, what did you do today? Johnson couldn't say what he had really been doing, so he made up stories, and soon the lies began to catch up with him. You come home and you're sunburned. You might smell like sunscreen. You might have cut grass on the, in the cuffs of your pants. And it caught up with him at work, too, after he made a hole in one. The ball hit right and below the pin, jumped forward, curved to the left, went in the hole. I'm supposed to be working. And now, in the Minneapolis paper sports section the next day, they published holes in one. And my boss at the time was a sports guy. He's reading the sports page. There's Doug Johnson. That's my Doug Johnson. Yeah. Busted. Busted, big time. What yeah. happened? Well, it wasn't shortly thereafter that we parted company. Johnson says the time he spent on the golf course not only cost him his career, but also his family. Eventually, his wife divorced him, and he's still estranged from his two daughters. I've allowed it to take family, jobs. It was my drug of choice. Addiction, obsession, compulsion, uh, the little white lies that turn into pretty big lies. What regrets do you have? Family. Family more than anything. Uh, what, it, what I allowed it to do to my children and my ex-wife is unforgivable. In fact, I hope someday to have forgiveness. No one from Johnson's family would agree to an on-camera interview. But his daughter, Jessica, confirmed to Outside the Lines that it was her father's compulsive golfing that cost him those relationships. Clients, is this a duck? He now lives with his girlfriend and works part-time at the Home Depot. We certainly have uh, quite a few models on display here. And Being a family man and having kids, um, that's tragic. S scary? Kinda. Kind of, because, you know, it, it is an addiction. It is, it is an addiction, and, you know, just like any other addiction, uh, it could go left. Can someone really go that far down a path to the point where you would lose your family, your home, everything, just for a game? I'm hoping that I can stay grounded enough to where that doesn't happen to me. Johnson says these days he's golfing less and prioritizing his life better. He understands his story is a cautionary tale. So it's always target, target, target. I'm not quite as obsessed as I was. I've given in to the fact that it's never going to leave me, but I can choose to control it. Beautiful. And I'm trying as hard as I can to make better choices. Joining us to talk about being addicted to golf, John O'Hearn, the author of Sweet Spot, Confessions of a Golfaholic, 
Richard Odie, the founder and president of GolfWRX.com. Alex Myers, the associate editor of Golf Digest magazine. And Dr. Alan Shapiro, the senior advisor at RG Psychological Services and the author of Golf's Mental Hazards, Overcome Them and Put an End to the Self-Destructive Round. I want to start with you, Dr. Shapiro. What is your definition of an addiction? Well, an addiction is uh, when you take a natural need or uh, a desire to experience pleasure in life, which is part of the human condition, and you get beyond a point of uh, just looking to maximize pleasure and minimize pain to the extent where it debilitates daily functioning and it interferes with daily relationships. John, how addictive is golf? Oh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's terribly addictive. I was watching a, a pro-am show uh, years ago and they were talking to some um, uh, rock and roll guy who was uh, playing golf and they said to him, so we understand you're, you're pretty hooked on golf. And he said, golf is the heroin of sports. And uh, I thought he was right on with that. Richard, how destructive can it be if someone cannot get enough of this obsession? Well, I think that uh, heroin of sports is, is a lot better off than being uh, um, addicted to uh, chemical or, or alcohol where the consequences can be jails, institutions, and death. I think the consequences of uh, golf are, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, there's a big gap between the two. But as we just saw in the piece, it can result in the loss of family or a job in an extreme case. Uh, Alex, how often have you seen this kind of addiction to the, to the game be exhibited? You know, I really haven't seen it that often. I know uh, Golf Digest did a story uh, a few years back about s several relationships that did go sour, and golf seemed to be uh, the main cause for those relationships. But I, I think that's a small, you know, those are very rare instances. Uh, you know, usually all the people I know, once they have a family, once they settle down, it seems like they play significantly less golf. Uh, which is kind of the logical progression. Dr. Shapiro, how do you strike that balance? Well, I think that, uh, you know, when you look at, at, at golf and uh, the game of golf, uh, golf is a, is a, is a sport that, that simulates real life. And people who get caught up with their identity is caught up in their golf game. That's, uh, that's an issue that goes way beyond just golf. So in a, a golf addict is someone who is going to have a problem or a source somewhere else in some other aspect of life. And what they have to do is they have to realize that as, golf, as, as addictions go, golf's a pretty good one. You know, you're getting outdoors, you're, you're recreating, you're, uh, you're getting fresh air, but uh, there comes a point where if it's debilitating your life and interfering with relationships, you have to take a close look at your, your basic personality. John, what is that line that you can't cross? Well, you know, I love I love the piece, and I love the the first gentleman that was talking was saying, and this to me is the real key is that it feels really, really good, and uh, you end up making because of that you end up making uh, poor decisions uh, because you're so anxious to repeat that feeling. And I myself have stood in front of a ball machine with a token in my hand, dripping sweat. I'm already a half an hour late for my son's birthday party. And yet the token goes in, and as the balls cascade into the basket below, I'm thinking it's the best decision I've ever made. Um, and even though I know that it's all wrong, but I think that it's hard to draw the line. Uh, I think the key to the whole thing is that if you are in a relationship, you have to be very honest and open about it. Um, uh, I just know so many guys who uh, hedge the corners and say, oh, I'm going out to get a uh, carton of milk or I'm going to go to the hardware store, but they actually go hit a couple of buckets and come home with their golf club hanging out of their pocket and everybody knows where they've been, but, you know, uh, those, are, those are the lines you have to make a decision about. We're talking about spouses here. What about children, uh, Richard, and the fact that uh, there can be games that are missed, practices, uh, recitals, things that the golf can sort of take over if the male or female is not careful and is playing too much. Well, I think again, you know, you're talking about someone, um, you know, if you start missing your, your, your children's baseball games and, and not showing up when you should be, you know, you've got a, you've got a hard time uh, with balance and moderation, then, 
I think it, there's a lot of things you could fall prey to in terms of addiction. So, like, uh, like I think it was John that said, you know, there is a line, and when you start crossing the line, you got to start checking yourself. And, um, you know, as Alex said, we're not seeing a lot of this. I'm not seeing a lot of it, at least on our online community. You know, at, at our site, our readers, we're not seeing that type of unmanageability where their lives become you know, uh, unmanageable, they're losing their families, they're losing, you know, their marriages, uh, their, their jobs. Uh, we're not, that's a very, very rare case that at least I've been able to, to witness in all my days. Alex, let me turn to you about the game of golf. The numbers are down, uh, there are more courses being closed than being opened. What is happening right now in terms of golf participation? Well, yeah, from a participation standpoint, I think the numbers have been very stagnant for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, you mentioned courses closing down. Of course, that, that was more a sign of uh, the recession. But I think the, the biggest, uh, you know, drawback is, is the time factor. And I think that, you know, people, you know, as jobs, uh, responsibilities increase, uh, you know, people slowing down with families, and, you know, they have less time. And, you know, we, we say let's get out there, play nine holes or, you know, do what you can to play golf, but even playing nine holes takes two or three hours. And I just think most people, you know, it's tougher and tougher to find that gap and that window of time. And uh, that's why I do think I haven't seen that many cases of, uh, you know, golf addiction adversely affecting families because I just think the people realize they don't have enough time and, and they haven't been playing as much golf. John, why are the numbers down? Well, I think he hit it right on the head. I think it's the time. Um, uh, you know, if you've got a family and you've got kids who are playing games and uh, soccer games and uh, your wife's working and you're working, which is probably a, a, a the case in many, many occasions, uh, nobody has the time to go do that. So either the entire family plays together, which I've seen a lot of uh, where I work, or um, golf has to take a hit. How healthy is the sport, Alex? I think the sport is, is pretty healthy. I, you know, again, the participation numbers are a little worrisome that, that the game isn't growing like, like we'd like to see it grow, but it's certainly not, you know, shrinking. Um, and I think that's good. I think, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it's not the NBA or the NFL, but, you know, you have a fair, you know, fair amount of interest in the pro sport. I think that draws more fans into the game. And uh, so, you know, I think golf is in a pretty good shape right now, uh, but, but certainly we're looking to try to promote it, get more people in the game, get more people hooked. Obviously, we don't want people to take it to an extreme and, and start having other parts of their lives suffer, but, <laughs> but certainly, uh, you know, it, it's a game that uh, we love and we promote, and we, we want more people to, to get out there and play. Richard, how would you gauge the health of the sport, certainly at the grassroots level? I would have to agree with, uh, with what everyone said. I think that the sport's coming off a little bit of a a Tiger effect let down, you know, I, I think it was pretty exciting watching Tiger go from from uh, the amateur ranks all the way up to number one and then sustain that and I think that also uh, You know people are using it's a different it's a different world today than it was 10 20 years ago 30 40 years ago Even that you know you got devices now you got instant gratification. I think people are uh, used to things that that um, that can get them quick fixes, and uh, golf certainly isn't that. It's a, it's you know, like someone said, it's a two-hour nine holes, four-hour eighteen holes, and uh, there's a lot, there's a lot to it in terms of time. Dr. Shapiro, how often have you treated someone for a golf addiction of any sort? Uh, a couple times. Uh, I. I think that usually when uh, an individual has a golf addiction, there are other addictive aspects to the game, possibly uh, the drinking that goes with it, the gambling. Interesting how we say the, uh, that uh, golf is, uh, might be less than the numbers of people playing, but yeah, we see casinos opening. So, uh, so much for the c cultural concern about uh, addictive behavior. But uh, I I've seen golfers with addictive patterns where they've lost their family and uh, friends and where they've lost sight and to them success or failure is based on their most recent golf round not anything else it it, it, it simplifies life when you have uh, an addictive approach to golf and a good day is a day where you played well and a bad day is a day where you didn't play well just simplifies it all and that's really the root of all addictive behavior and how do you counsel them if someone comes in with this kind of addiction well, it's not unlike any addiction whereby uh, uh, there, 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 are, there are, of course, programs, 12 Steps are most known for it. There isn't a Golfers Anonymous that I know of at, at this point, but basically <laughs> we try to uh, 
to get people to understand that they're powerless over it and to get family support surrounding them and to uh, oftentimes abstain or at least have a program for moderation. Now I know those that cover the game from a television perspective would love if people are addicted to watching the games on television, Alex. How addictive can that be to watch these events? Well, you know, I think for the most part the people who are watching are the ones who play. I think that's one of the, the cool aspects of golf. You can really relate to pros. It's not like, you know, you can go out there and, and uh, dunk a basketball like Kobe Bryant, um, you know, or LeBron James. But, uh, you know, golf, you can hit a shot, you can make a birdie on a hole, say, oh, I played that course, Tiger Woods played that course. You can relate to that. So I think that's where, you know, they draw fans in, uh, being able to relate to the pro level. And, uh, you know, certainly, obviously, Tiger, it does drive the sport still. Him coming back recently is a big boon for, for TV ratings and everything else. But, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of great young players to watch, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get to see more of them in the future years. Let me spin this a different way, John. I mean, how healthy is it to have that sense of community for people, especially older individuals, to play on a daily basis, you know, five, six, seven days a week, John? Well, I, I work at a golf course. I see that all the time. Um, they, it's, it has become their job. They get up in the morning and they go to work, and their job is to play golf and have fun. Um, but I, you know, I can't help but I just keep thinking about, um, you know, why is golf so addictive? And I think it is addictive. And I, the reason is, is, that, is that pleasure sensation out of a really flush shot. Uh, there's really no getting around that, and I've thought about it a long time. It took me three years to write this novel about it, and what I really came away with was this idea that, uh, and like the prior gentleman just said, you can kind of achieve a, a semi-professional kind of feel and swing, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a little bit rare in golf to do that, and when you do, you feel a little special. Uh, you feel like you're doing something really unique, and you own it, and you alone own it. Uh, and you protect it. Um, once you've got it, you'll do anything to keep it. And uh, I see a lot of that too. You can go to any driving range and watch people swing, and most of them really can't hit it, and they're only there for that one shot. Let me just get one good shot, and that's golf. And that's probably the imperfect nature of the game that uh, makes it even more addictive. <laughs> uh, obviously, we've seen that in the piece. Appreciate the conversation. John O'Hearn, Richard Odie, Alex Myers, and Dr. Shapiro. Thank you. And as always, you can join our conversation on our Facebook page. Follow the show on Twitter at OTL on ESPN. Follow me on Twitter at ESPN Andy Katz. And of course, listen to our podcast. You can download it at iTunes. We'll be right back. Applebee's Take Two menu lets you choose two entrees on one plate, like the new grilled by Dahlia onion sirloin or the new light and zesty shrimp scampi linguine. You can have both. Great choice, buddy. Applebee's Take Two menu starting at 10.99. See you tomorrow.